Uh, welcome everyone to our webinar on the Vietnam's impact, excuse me, <laughs> the climate impacts decision support to lessons learned webinar. Uh, we have a very special presentation for you today uh, and I'm really excited that you've joined us. Um, our online, audi online audience is from around the world. We expect over 120 participants. So thanks so much uh, for joining and taking the time. Um, special thanks also to our Agility IRG webinar team for putting this webinar together. Jamie Carson and Dar Maxwell have worked really hard to, to get this going. So thanks so much. Um, I'd like to just cover uh, some housekeeping before we begin. Uh, today's webinar is recorded. It will be posted on our website, ccrdproject.com, for your review. It's just an hour long, uh, so after my short introduction, we're going to see 30-minute presentations from Cascadia Consulting, and then we'll do a 25-minute question and answer session. Uh, we welcome your questions in the chat box on the right. Uh, please be conscious that your typing is public. Everyone sees what you're writing, uh, and again, it'll be recorded. Uh, questions will be addressed in order received uh, in the second half of today's webinar. It's, it'll be quite helpful if you keep your questions short and concise. Um, I would say the same to the presenters. Please keep your answers short so we can get through um, as many questions as, as we can today. Uh, finally, there are resources on Simpact DST for you to download on the left-hand side of your screen. Um, okay. So with the housekeeping issues out of the way, let me just introduce myself. Uh, my name is Michael Cody. I'm your moderator today. Um, I'm the communications director for USAID's Climate Resilient Development Project, which is based in Washington, DC. Um, our presenters today, the first of our two presenters today is Andrea Martin. Andrea Martin is a very busy senior associate with Cascadia Consulting. She's based in Washington, excuse me, in Seattle, Washington. And she specializes in developing tools for decision making uh, and adaptation planning in the Pacific Northwest and also in Vietnam. Our second presenter today is Tu Tran. Tu is an associate with Cascadia Consultant. She uh, supports several climate related initiatives in Seattle and is the technical support lead for the SIMPAC DST work in Vietnam. I actually traveled with Andrea and Tu across Vietnam last year. And I can tell you they're highly skilled technical specialists. I really enjoy uh, working with them both. Um, I want to just cover one thing before we get into Andrea's slides, and that is uh, where the SIMPAC DST project fits. And it's uh, under the CCRD project, the Climate Change Resilient Development Project. Um, CCRD, I'll refer to the Climate Change Resilient De Development Project as CCRD. Um, CCRD is a four-year initiative of USAID's Global Climate Change Office in Washington, DC. There are several activities under CCRD, the centerpiece of which is the CRD framework. That's the Climate Resilient Development Framework uh, that helps guide decision makers on mainstreaming adaptation into their respective programs and projects. Besides our Vietnam work, uh, activities under CCRD include development and support for climate services, national adaptation planning, urban infrastructure, and we have some work in high mountain communities in Nepal and Peru. CCRD uh, includes nine partners, including private companies, universities, and NGOs. Cascadia, of course, is a, um, a private company uh, partner based in Seattle, Washington. Uh, briefly, before I pass it on to Andrea, uh, there are three objectives of CCRD. The first, uh, you can see in the blue boxes there, the first on the left is supporting USAID missions and bureaus. The second objective is to coordinate with government agencies to help mainstream adaptation. And then the third is to identify and fill gaps uh, in emerging issues. The work you'll hear about today in Vietnam is under the emerging issues component. Uh, we first piloted the SIMPAC DST in a coastal city in central Vietnam under CCRD. And since that pilot a couple of years ago, several communities in Vietnam have now picked up using the tool across the country. So it's a very successful pilot for USAID. Um, and now, Andrea, to you. 
Thank you, Michael, for providing that broader context. Um, I'll now dive right into our project, uh, talking about the objectives, methodology, and some of the outcomes that we've seen to date. And then I'll pass it over to Tu, and she'll elaborate a little more on lessons learned through this project and our future outlook for how this tool will be used and employed moving forward. So Climate Impact Decision Support Tool, or CIMPAC DST, was originally developed for the City of Seattle, and its objective is to support the consideration of climate change in everyday decision making, so supporting that mainstreaming goal. Um, it's based in Microsoft Excel, so it's very easy to use, very accessible to its users, quick and straightforward. Uh, this screenshot here um, is from the Vietnam version. So you can see it's an Excel tool, but it has a very palatable user interface. So we, the goal is to make this very easy to use. Um, how it works is it has information that's preloaded or embedded. Uh, that information includes local climate projections, climate hazard maps, sector-specific impacts, and policy information. And then based on user inputs on a project, the tool essentially applies a filter to provide output information. The input information about the project includes the lifespan of the project. So is this a bridge with a 20-year expected lifetime or 50-year expected lifetime, for example? The location of that project relative to other locations and the exposure of that location to various types of climate impacts as well as the sector of the project. Um, and based on those inputs, the tool provides three primary pieces of output information. The first is a summary of the latest climate projections for that location of interest as well as for that time frame of interest. So it provides streamlined project projections of precipitation, temperature, and anticipated sea level rise changes. Uh, the second piece is a summary of local impacts for specific sectors. So, for example, how will increases in temperature affect transportation planning? Or how will changes in precipitation affect forestry management? Uh, and the third piece of information is sector-specific guidelines and recommendations um, so that decision makers and managers in those sectors can understand not only how climate change is expected to impact that sector, but what are some options that can be considered to build resilience in that project to projected climate change impacts. So for example, what are some areas that may be avoided for certain types of development? Uh, what are some materials that may be optimally used um, given these future climate projections? Um, so the tool, as I mentioned, was originally developed for City of Seattle staff, and USAID became interested in customizing and deploying it for a developing country context. Um, and Vietnam was chosen as a pilot city and country um, for a variety of reasons, one being that it's rapidly developing, it has more than 760 cities and towns, and it also has a substantial coastline. The country has over 3,000 kilometers of low elevation coastlines, um, and over 100 of the country's cities and towns are located along that coastline. So Vietnam has particularly high exposure and sensitivity to sea level rise and other coastal dynamics. So what are the kinds of climate impacts that are expected in Vietnam? Um, well, one key point here and one um, key factor that informed how we customize this tool is that impacts really vary largely from region to region within Vietnam. It's a very long country, um, and those different areas have uh, topological differences uh, that will influence how climate change plays out in those regions. But we can make some kind of general statements in terms of how Vietnam may experience climate change in the future. And one is that um, preliminary analysis of projections show that there may be a decrease in the number of tropical cyclones, but an increase in their intensity. So we'll see more extreme storms in the future. Um, and with those extreme storms, we'll also expect accelerated coastal erosion. Uh, the projected range of sea level rise is between 100 and 400 millimeters by 2050 along the coast of Vietnam. And that 
um, compounded with more extreme storms will likely accelerate coastal erosion, which is already a major issue for many developing cities and towns along the coast. We'll also expect more severe flooding. Uh, annual rainfall changes across the seven regions of Vietnam uh, vary widely. They're projected to range between negative 16 and uh, positive 36 percent by 2050. Um, and however, summer rainfall is projected to decrease throughout Vietnam. Uh, but in central Vietnam, which is the location of our pilot tool deployment in Hue, um, it's expected that rainfall will increase for all the other seasons. And Hue is a town that experiences flooding on an annual basis already, and so we'll see an increased severity in that flooding moving forward. Um, and with those changes in precipitation patterns, we'll also expect a change in the risk of landslides. And this is especially important in the northern mountainous areas of the country, um, where there is significant transportation infrastructure development connecting these small developing towns in the mountainous areas. Um, and, these, and these areas are already experiencing landslide. And these are significant infrastructure investments um, that are already at risk. And we'll see increased risk likely uh, moving forward. So given these significant climate impacts that are expected for this country, our objective with this project was to deploy a climate impacts decision support tool that is sustainable, customized for the user, and also nationally applicable across the country to facilitate integration of climate change considerations into urban planning in Vietnam. So this was a little bit different from the tool that we originally developed for the city of Seattle um, for a variety of reasons. Um, one is that we uh, transferred ownership of the tool to the Vietnamese people. Um, so this was a new challenge for us and, a, and an interesting um, component of this project. And we've learned a lot of lessons through that that too we'll talk about. Um, also, the goal was to create a pilot project in Hue, which is highlighted in green here, that's Tua Tien Hue province, but then that pilot tool would inform a broadly applicable national tool um, that users all the way from the northern mountainous regions to the lower Mekong will be able to effectively employ to consider climate change in their planning decisions. So it was a, a, a big challenge, um, but we were up for it. The target outcomes from this project were um, fourfold. Uh, firstly, we were interested in increasing the access to climate information. We conducted a needs assessment when we first embarked on this project to try to understand how these urban planners um, and construction departments are currently accessing climate information. And by and large, they were simply Googling climate change um, to try and find information relevant to them. Um, so. Our hope was that through developing a tool like this, we could make access to climate information um, much more easy and, um, and readily done. The second goal was to increase the understanding of local climate impacts and how they relate to urban planning. Um, so understanding why should an urban planner care about climate change? Why is this something they should be thinking about in the first place? And then thirdly, we wanted to enhance consideration of climate change impacts into urban planning. So actually taking that understanding of local climate impacts and incorporating it into the planning process and potentially making alterations to your plan to make it more resilient. And then fourthly, through this process, we are interested in increasing the interaction between urban planners and climate scientists. Um, in Vietnam, it's really no exception. Um, I know we see this all around the world where government departments are fairly siloed. And so, you know, urban planners don't often talk to departments of natural resources. So our goal through this project was to bring those parties together and create an ongoing dialogue um, so that these departments can leverage each other's resources and um, enhance their respective projects. Our approach um, was first to begin with a needs assessment, so doing some research, talking to urban planners in the region to really understand what their needs and motivations are, specifically around a tool like this and around considering climate change. 
The second piece was to finalize a tool scope of use. So that was understanding who is the ideal audience for this tool, how would they use the tool, where are they coming from, um, where are they located, and developing an initial plan for rolling it out across the country. How are we going to get the word out? How are we going to make sure everyone's trained up? Uh, the third piece was to gather local climate impacts and spatial information. Um, this included national level reports that were available all the way down to provincial climate action plans. So we really tried to span that geographic scale um, and gather any information that would be relevant and helpful for urban planners as they move through this process. Uh, the fourth stage was to develop and populate a tool template. Um, that was, of, of course, in the local language so that it could be beta tested by its users. Um, but it also required a stakeholder engagement process where we understood um, you know, what formats, designs, representations most resonate with these users and allow the tool to, to be um, most easily picked up and understood and used effectively. Uh, we beta tested the tool and incorporated any feedback from that beta testing. And then finally, we transferred the tool to local ownership and trained users and administrators on how to employ the tool within their planning projects and maintain and update the tool over time as new information becomes available. So I'm just going to go through these phases in a little more detail to provide you with some examples of how we customized and trained and um, designed a sustainable tool within this project. So first, uh, the, through the customization process, as I mentioned, it involved an extensive stakeholder engagement process where we sat down with urban planners and said, OK, how do you currently plan? How do you organize your information? Um, how do you? Uh, you know, spatially organize that information. And through those conversations, we developed a schematic like you see on the screen here. So on the right-hand side, you can see the various sectors that are included in this tool. And these are the sectors that are used by urban planners in Vietnam to organize their reports and their plans for, um, for their re review process. Uh, we also aligned it with the planning, types of planning in Vietnam. So we have regional planning, general planning, detailed zoning planning, for example. Um, and we also allowed the tool to provide uh, locally specific information for the 58 provinces, five centrally controlled cities, and 760 cities and towns. So this means that, for example, if a city developed a new policy document that dictated um, elevation, ground elevation levels for certain areas of the city that may be vulnerable to flooding, we could include that policy information into the tool so that users are aware of this policy and can access it and incorporate it into their planning. Um, we reviewed a number of resources that were available and include anything that could be relevant and useful for urban planning purposes. Um, so this snapshot here shows uh, the resources that we consulted for the pilot tool in Hue. So you can see on the left-hand side, we were able to leverage um, an existing vulnerability assessment process and kind of pick up where they left off to take that vulnerability assessment document and make it a more living and applicable product for um, the, those that would benefit from its use. Uh, we pulled from um, documents created by international organizations, local NGOs, um, international NGOs, as well as available government documents. Um, after the customization process, our next task was to train, was to ensure that urban planners across the country knew about this tool, understood how to use it, and um, had everything they needed to be able to move forward and incorporate climate change in their planning. So this map on the right shows the locations of the trainings as red dots. And these are locations that our team, in collaboration with our project partner, the Vietnam Institute for Urban and Rural Planning, physically went to these provinces, met with the departments of construction, as well as other related departments, and sat down with them with their laptops and walked through the tool. Um, so you can see this picture in the background shows um, 
Na, who's the woman on the left-hand side, she is the primary tool administrator in Hanoi, and she's sitting down um, with one of the trainees and working through the tool with him so that he understands all of its aspects. Um, you can see the blue star here on the map is the location of Hue, so that's the central location of our pilot tool, and we also conducted beta testing in three different provinces that are the gray shaded areas to the south and northern areas of the country. Um, we also provide a user guide for the tool users so that after the training, if they've forgotten anything or they have questions or need to troubleshoot, they can consult the user guide later um, to help them with those issues. So after conducting the training, it became very clear to us that there was a need to ensure that this tool can be sustained over time, that as new climate projections become available, which as we all know, this uh, they become available all the time, uh, we need to make sure that the trained tool administrators are able to understand and incorporate that new information so the tool stays relevant and stays useful for its target audience. Um, so we worked closely in 2015 with our primary project partners to build what we call a sustainable update and maintenance mechanism. And I won't go into too much detail here, maybe we can go in a little more in the Q&A, um, but just to give you an overview, um, one of our primary goals through the sustainability planning process was to bridge two kind of gaps that exist. And one was opening a line of communication between the national level urban planning organizations and the local level urban planning organizations. So this would allow the national level tool administrators to be able to easily understand what the needs are at the local level and communicate that up to inform the tool. Um, and the second piece that we sought to connect was between the urban planning organizations at the national level and the climate scientists at the national level. So we work closely throughout the process with the Vietnam Institute for Meteorology, Hydrology, and Environment, who produce the kind of accepted climate projections for the country. Um, we work closely with them throughout the project, but we really didn't connect them to the urban planners until a little bit later in the game. So two will talk a little bit about um, you know, sort of our lessons learned in that aspect, but we decided um, it became very clear that we needed to bridge that gap. So during our next, tr our last trip that we had recently, we introduced those two parties and started that conversation, um, and they actually went to get drinks afterwards. So I think <laughs> we uh, successfully uh, implemented the <laughs> blind date there. So uh, given the uh, work that we've done to date in training up users and customizing this tool for Vietnam urban planning. Here are some outcomes that we've seen so far. Um, so we've trained 340 people to use this tool, and that includes uh, dissemination at a national workshop that we held in Hanoi in July 2014, and that included representation from 12 provinces across the country. We also trained 14 people to manage and update the tool over time. So this was that administrator training. Um, we trained up 14 people and then later realized it really makes sense to have one focal point administrator. So although 14 people are trained, we expect that there'll be um, about three people who will be the primary tool administrators moving forward. And as we know of, there are 12 plans that um, have been modified or revisited as a result of applying this tool. Um, so these are plans that um, maybe were being developed and then they used the tool to modify or make adjustments or they were already developed and they used it as, during the review process. This is a quote uh, from the head of urban architecture and planning division in central Vietnam, just to give you a feel for how the tool has been employed. He asked the staff to use the tool and said, when my staff learned that the site was under a flooding area, they came up with different solutions for how to adapt to the scenario. Um, so it was great to see that he asked the staff to use it and that it actually resulted in some adjustments to the plan. Um, this is another example of how the tool has been used. This is Vinh Tang Commune in central Vietnam. Um, and they use the tool to inform three primary planning changes, 
One related to the location of residential zoning. Um, they relocated further inland to protect against storm surge. The second was the type of coastal tourism. Um, they decided to emphasize kind of lower impact, small um, beach huts and restaurants as a coastal tourist infrastructure as opposed to large scale resort and hotel infrastructure that could have you know, high costs associated with any sort of storm damage. And then they also decided to keep this, um, this drainage area um, maintained as agriculture and aquaculture practices. Um, and that was a way to allow that area to act as a flood storage um, to protect inland residential and commercial areas. So that gives you a flavor for our um, kind of methodology and customizing and deploying this tool as well as how it's been used. And I'll now turn over to Tu, who will give you some reflections on what we've learned through this process. Well, thank you, Andrea, for handing it over to me. Um, again, I am too with Cascadia Consulting Group. Um, as a Vietnamese native, it has been a great honor for me to work on this project, which directly benefits my country. Um, so I will spend the next 15 minutes or so to talk about different lessons that we learned after three years of implementing this project. So let's get it started. The first lesson that we learned is to leverage existing processes and resources. Um, instead of building um, a stakeholder group or review process from scratch, it saves both the project team and different stakeholders a lot of time and resources to use um, and leverage existing processes, momentum, or resources. Um, that included making sure that the tool is compatible with existing planning processes of Vietnam, um, as well as partnering up with the um, different stakeholder groups in Vietnam um, to conduct additional outreach and get a tune fed feedback. And the different stakeholder groups here include um, the Urban Climate Resilience Community of Practice in Hanoi, Vietnam, or the Mekong Building Resilience to Climate in Asian Cities Network, um, short, name, short name Embrace. So those stakeholder groups were really helpful in um, helping us um, making sure that the tool use was popularized and um, helping us get a get the right content for the tool. On the screen, you can see the guideline of integrating climate change response into urban planning in Vietnam, which was developed by our main in-country collaborator of this project, the Vietnam Institute for Urban and Rural Planning, VIAP, um, and funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, so the project team, um, instead of creating something from scratch, we um, use the content of this great guideline and put that into the tool. Um, tool users really appreciate that, and so did our um, in-country collaborator, VIAP, uh, because they spent a lot of time and resources on developing this piece. And the second lesson is we should always try to establish and foster key relationships. Um, having close collaborative relationships with local and respected climate experts and key stakeholder organizations was vital to gathering locally relevant and official climate information as well as overall project support. Having the Vietnam Institute for Urban Rural Planning engage as a partner from the beginning with a clear intent to fully transfer the tool after beta testing really help us develop um, a sense of ownership for view well before the project closes down. As a result, the willing to uh, continue to put time and effort into updating and maintaining the tool for some time, even after the end of the project, without new funding. We we'll, we we'll also um, engage with the Vietnam Institute of Meteorology, Hydrology, and Environment. Um, short name Imhen, um, to gather um, official uh, national level climate data and spatial information. Um, however, we realized that um, our relationship with Imhen was a little bit one-sided because we always, almost always went to them for data without returning or offering anything concrete in return. Um, so um, it's understandable that they demonstrated interest in the final project outcomes, but not so willing to formalize their commitment to continue involvement with the tool maintenance in the future. Uh, but as Andrea, Andrea mentioned, we um, 
we, we managed to fix that a little bit um, at the end when we um, were able to schedule a formal meeting between Imhan and Viop to um, have them work together and um, develop maybe an, an official relationship so they can work on um, not just this project, but um, also future climate uh, change um, relevant projects. We as a project team also value one-on-one -on -one working sessions with local tune partners. Um, on the slide, you can see the two pictures of me and Andrea working directly with tune administrators in uh, Thừa Thiên Huế province and at the Vietnam Institute for Urban Rural Planning. Um, to these close working, rela uh, working sessions, uh, we really develop a deep collaborative relationship with our partners and really learn what their needs, concerns, and priorities are so we can better customize a tool for future use. We also always try to put our local partners in the spotlight, and that's the next lesson. Um, so the consultant team, Cascadia, um, always try to make an effort to take a backseat to local partners and key meetings and workshops so that other stakeholders um, were used to viewing them as project leaders and tool owners um, so that the transition of the project at the end um, could be less abrupt. And on the screen, you can see um, here are the two key tool advocates from Thừa Thuyên Huế province down below and from the Vietnam Institute for Urban Rural Planning um, above. Um, they are presenting on the tool in some meetings. And um, this really helped create a strong sense of ownership and responsibility for the tool um, among our local partners. Um, Another very important lesson is that we should think about scaling and sustainability early. So clear plans and steps for sustained use and maintenance after project completion should be outlined as early in the process as possible to best position the project for long-term tax success. Um, we started the uh, number of efforts early in the project. So when we first embark on this project, we um, actually conducted a detailed needs assessment and scope of use with the Vietnam Institute for Urban Rural Planning, um, our in-country collaborator. And knowing um, how and by whom the tool is, gonna, is going to be used really help us customize a tool with the best available climate data. Um, and after our national workshop um, on tool dis dissemination last July, um, we realized that there's still a lot of needs around the tool. So we started a number of efforts um, on the sustainability planning um, for the future use of the tool. And that's when we conducted, um, we started thinking about conducting um, additional tool trainings in other provinces um, of Vietnam this year. Well, another lesson is to get local. So um, we the project team always try to integrate locally generated and le relevant information whenever possible. Um, we realized that Toon user wanted to um, include local maps and data on climate change whenever possible. And they also really appreciate that the tool we developed reflects the types of planning and time horizons typically used in Vietnam. Um, they're very vocal about um, the, the fact that they will be more willing to use and own this tool if it's customized just for them. So um, on the slide is a map from a province in the Mekong Delta, Vietnam. Um, and it's the um, rainfall changes map. So um, during one of our trainings this year, we were able to gather this map from the province, uh, the provincial climate action plan. and. Uh, we were able to put that into the tool. So um, the provincial tool users will um, really show their um, appreciation of this integration. And the last lesson is to make it official. So um, on the slide is uh, actually the photo of a very important meeting um, in our project. It's a meeting between the uh, Provincial People's Committee of Thừa Thiên Huế province. Uh, in central Vietnam um, with a project team. Uh, and um, during this meeting, um, a, we discussed and 
decided to um, they decided to issue an official um, decision to request different provincial departments to work together in order to further customize the tool and make sure that the tool is updated. Um, so achieving this official support from the Provincial People's Committee was a critical step towards the sustained use and improvement of the tool in Thu Thinh Hue province alone. And in our last trip to Vietnam, um, in one of our meetings with different provincial project partners. Um, other provinces also noted that making the tool use mandatory would ensure the tool use. Um, however, they, um, they say that it could be a long um, process that takes years because they not all of them have the leverage to do that like in Thu Hue province. So with all those lessons learned, what will the future look like? Um, we believe that BIOP the Vietnam Institute for Urban Rural Planning, um, our partner, has knowledge and capacity to continue maintaining and updating the tool, and they would like to see it widely used. Um, as Dr. Liu Duc Ming, the, one of the key staff from BIOP, said, I will ask my staff to use the tool always. However, we realize that time and resource constraints will um, potentially present challenges. Um, BIOP estimated that uh, it will take potentially $1,600 a year to pay for their staff to keep the minimum maintenance and update of the tool. Um, and they will continue doing that in the near future, um, even without additional funding. Um, but Cascadia and BIOP are trying hard to explore different um, funding mechanisms to make sure that we can meet this amount. It's not that big, but you know, without it, it, it could be it could pose a potential challenge. Um, also, as Andrea mentioned, um, a new relationship forged between VIOP and IMHAN, the two key players in this project, the urban planners and the climate experts, um, kind of form through our last trip's meeting between them, may build a long-term collaboration among urban planners and climate scientists in Vietnam, um, which is a great news. We also realize that some provinces are more likely to continue using the tool than others. Um, so for example, Thu Thinh Hue province, where we first developed this tool um, in Vietnam, as well as the Vietnam Institute for Urban Rural Planning uh, staff, they may be more likely to use the tool because they have got a lot of training and they have been more um, engaged more often than the other provinces. Um, Last but not least, we also learned from our recent interviews with different provincial project partners that the use of the tool may be expanded to consultants, um, meaning the private, different private construction um, and planning companies who work for provincial construction departments and VIOP itself. Um, these consultants um, work on a lot of different smaller scale projects and plans for provinces and um, the Vietnam Institute for Urban Rural Planning. Um, however, they normally the last people to learn or know about climate change. Um, so that's that's a good news to know that they will be more likely to be exposed to this tool and um, maybe will be trained to use it. Um, so um, those are the lessons um, and the future outlook of the project and the tool. Um, we have different publications on this project that are published on the CCRD website. Um, and you can go to the website at ccrdproject.com to download all the publications that we have. Um, and with that said, I would like to pass it over to Michael. He will start the Q&A discussion session. And um, thank you all for listening again. And please bring any questions that you have. Sue and Andrea, thank you very much for uh, that very nice um, overview of the tool and then the lessons learned from the process of installing and sharing the tool across Vietnam. Um, I just want to note that, um, that some of the pictures that you saw during the webinar today were, that were used in today's presentation were, um, were taken by Andrea and Tu and others um, in Vietnam in relation to this project. So they were very, very nice. Um, um, 
there were nice images for everyone to see about the project. Um, uh, the work you've done, Andrea and Tu, and um, Cascadia in general, um, is quite valuable and sets a good precedent for um, good sustainable implementation, uh, especially for a pilot project. And I look forward to distributing um, your final assessment report, which is forthcoming um, within the next two weeks. I'll send that out to everyone that's on the participant list today and also to our adaptation community um, through CCRD. The report will also be on our library page, which Tu had mentioned, uh, with the other documents. And just note also for the audience that the documents are on the left left hand side of your screen. You can um, download some um, some overviews of the Simpact DST tool, but also some uh, reports that show uh, fine fine level detail of how the tool functions um, on the back end. Um, one thing that's really that I'm particularly interested in is in this tool. Um, is how this uh, went from uh, from pilot to wide use across Vietnam. It's quite interesting that um, you know it was first adopted in Seattle, and then it was uh, shaped and tested and expanded in Vietnam. Um, I think that's quite an accomplishment, um, especially for the adaptation community to pay attention to. Um, Andrea, I just want to ask one quick question to you, um, if you don't mind. Um, which which aspects of of, you know, this is before I get to the audience questions, which aspects of the local context makes the tool more likely to get traction? How did this tool get traction from, uh, from pilot um, to, to be more accepted across the country? Yeah. Um, you know, I think that uh, the fact that there was local data available was um, very valuable through this process. So in Huey, um, we benefited from the fact they had just completed a vulnerability assessment process. There's been quite a bit of climate work done in that location to date. Um, so we were able to leverage that data. Uh, when we scaled to the national level, um, it was a bit more challenging because that abundance of data um, was not available everywhere. Um, so it, that's when we realized we really needed to do this um, kind of boots on the ground uh, tour, training tour, um, to actually visit these provinces and understand what information they have available and integrate that information. Um, so, you know, I think having that information available uh, made it more likely to, to get traction. Um, and I think it's most useful in the context where you have some existing knowledge. Um, and, and I think it's also um, useful if, you're in a situation where the urban planners don't have ready access to this inf climate information, or they might have access to it, but it's in large piles of reports, um, and you know one just does not have the time or resources to go through all those um, to to go through all those papers. And so, in that way, it can streamline that information information and make it more kind of readily usable. Mm -hmm. And also, just um, as you mentioned earlier, just Kind of when you built um, the project itself, um, just including a sustainability plan for how this tool could actually um, be used afterwards, and then keeping that focus throughout the implementation was um, something that you guys did a really good job on. That, that'll come out in the report. Um, so let me um, let me just pivot to the audience. We have uh, several questions here. Um, you want to do kind of a rapid fire. Um, Kind of Q and A session here, so I'll, I'll primarily send them to Andrea. But Andrea, if you think two is the better responder, please hand them over to to two. Is that if that's okay? Sure. Um, so the first question we have is from Austin Becker. Austin Becker uh, is from the University of Rhode Island. He's a professor there in the Department of Marine and Affairs, and he asks. Uh, was there any assessment of available tools that led to the choice of this impact tool? And then secondarily, what advantages do you see of using this tool over others? I think one key advantage um, of this tool over what is available is that it can be customized for the local context. So many of the tools that are available, um, you know, they may be applicable for one particular country or one particular sector, but it's not as customized to um, align with the decision maker systems and processes in that location. Um, 
and I, but I think even more importantly than that, it allows the ability to fully transfer the technology and the ownership of the technology to the recipient. Um, by building it in Excel, it allows for the administrators that we train to easily be able to update and maintain it over time. And I think that's something I haven't really seen in the currently available tools. Um, they tend to be you know, pretty sophisticated modeling um, or projection tools that you know, would be rather difficult to update in-house if needed. Right, so some of the some of them are like are hand tailored software that would take a lot of training and um, interactive kind of figuring out in the future. But Excel seems to be um, the better advantage here. Is that right? Yeah, I mean Excel. You know, you don't have to reinstall it every time. Everybody already has Excel, um, and there's no cost to keeping it up to date or maintaining it. You don't have to hire out a consultant to do any additional coding or anything like that. Um, so I think it makes the technology transfer easier and more lasting um, than, you know, the alternatives. Okay, great. Um, Richard Krautemal um, from Dale, Maryland, International Environmental Data Rescue. He asked a question, um, and this goes back to how users um, were getting information in the beginning of, of of uh, the process. He asks, the fact that users depended on Google searches for obtaining climate information is disturbing. Do you think that this is due to the lack of ready, readily available climate projections from the government, in the government of Vietnam, or do you think that it's uh, because the government may, may not have sufficient digitized historic hydro meteorological data to, to develop those projections? Um, yeah, yeah ahead, there's Andrew. there's not a lack of data. The, we were actually quite impressed with the Institute of Meteorology, Hydrology, and Environment who produces these climate projections for the country. Um, they partner with CSIRO for their latest downscale climate projections, and they're actually pretty, pretty nicely done. Um, so it's not a data issue. It's more just being aware of how to access that data and the fact that it exists. Um, so we would start off almost every training pulling up the latest national climate projection report, um, which is sort of the go-to report for climate projections, and ask if they've seen it before. And maybe one or two people in the room would raise their hand, but most um, of these urban planners just don't even know this information exists. So it's really more about um, kind of getting access and knowing where to look. For this type of information. And were those reports in Vietnamese or English? They were a mix of both. There's more English than you would think. So I think there was definitely an advantage to having the tool in Vietnamese and translating some of those reports that are only available in English to Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, you know, let me let me just interrupt everyone here and just say that um, I'm going to try to get through several of these questions here quickly before one before two o'clock, but we can go over just a few minutes if uh, Andrea and two, if you want to stay on, um, you know, just five or ten minutes afterwards, we can we can keep going with the Q and A. Sure. Um, but for now, I'm going to I'm going to try to get these uh, five or six questions answered before the two p.m. deadline. Um, so next we have uh, Rose, Rose Schneider. She's a senior health and climate change advisor with health systems management. She asks, uh, many of the lessons learned are pretty good to find out about, um, uh, but these could be said about a lot of different types of projects. Um, are there more, specific, more specifics on the tool itself? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that one lesson we learned kind of specific to the technology component is uh, the need to accommodate a wide range of technologies and just be flexible. Um, so, you know, some provinces we visited and they had crystal clear Wi-Fi and everybody had a laptop and it had the latest version of Excel, so that was great. But other provinces we visited and their Wi-Fi was quite spotty or, you know, many people didn't have laptops, they had desktops and their Excel was ancient. Um, so I think mm -hmm. we learned to, that we needed to make sure this tool was flexible um, and could accommodate all of those situations, um, which I think it does. Um, I think it is. 
accommodable because um, you can use paper maps uh, to access climate hazard information or you can use fancy online maps. Um, so we were just able to incorporate that, that sort of spectrum of um, technology needs. And I think another lesson that I learned through this process is the delicate balance between simplicity and complexity. Um, the Huawei tool focused on one city, so it was rather simple um, and pretty straightforward for conducting the administrator training. But as we scaled up to the national level, we had to incorporate new systems like um, new databases to, to hold that information because it became overloaded for the capacity of, of Excel. Um, and so, you know, I think you know, in, in retrospect, I wonder, does it make sense to have one nationally applicable tool or would it make sense to kind of replicate what we did in Huey for, you know, different focus cities? Um, so making a tool that does only have one city focus um, as opposed to a nationally applicable one. Um, so those are things, you know, that I think are important to think about carefully through the process. Great, thanks. Um, Sasha Peterson. Uh, calling in or dialing in from Austin, Texas. He's with the American Society of Adaptation Professionals. He has two questions. First, um, will the session be recorded uh, and, and will he be able to share it with others after this uh, webinar? And the answer is yes. Um, this this uh, session is being recorded and we're going to send a link out to the participants in order to, um, to watch the webinar later, to download resources that are on the left side and also to share with their colleagues. Second question he asks is, um, what are the big, biggest challenges you faced while translating the tool developed in Seattle for the Vietnam context, the Vietnamese context? Yeah, I mean, so that sort of echoes what I mentioned before in terms of technology um, limitations and mm -hmm. just being making sure you can accommodate all of the ranges of technology that may be existing in the various locations you're working in. Um, for the Seattle tool, we used uh, their internal GIS server for the climate maps, um, but you know that hadn't existed yet uh, in Vietnam, and so we worked closely with VIAP to develop a similar system on their servers. Um, but it definitely required more uh, work from the beginning to set those systems up. We couldn't just pick up and, and work with what they already had. And then there was, of course, so the, the translation itself, <laughs> which <laughs> right. you know, was a big challenge. Right. So it sounds like also um, in the middle of working with this tool is that they already have some systems in place that you kind of have to plug into while they're developing, you know, their internal processes for a new, you know, such as the new database, right, the new GIS database. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, so it definitely required some troubleshooting and, I mean, so one situation is right after we conducted our um, trainings to nine provinces, we send an email out with a link to the tool to download from the VUP website and then realize that the VUP server was down for two weeks. <laughs> and so, you know, here we are at this critical point in the project where people are, you know, logging in and trying this tool out and they're not able to access um, some of the maps that were available. So, you know, it was just being able and willing to work through those challenges and address them early on um, so that, mm -hmm. you know, by the time the project comes to a close, you have all the systems in place and they've been tested. Great. Uh, Michelle Tai Shalar, sorry if I, I messed up your last name, Michelle. Uh, you're a climate scientist. She's a climate scientist from University of Hawaii. Thank you so much for calling in. Um, she asks, to what extent are locally and regionally downscaled climate and impact projections available for Vietnam? And how does the tool communicate uncertainties in these projections? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so as I mentioned, they have been downscaled to a large extent. Um, one limitation that we found is in the availability of gaining access to data and the forms that we needed. So they had these great um, maps that I presume were created in some kind of interface like GIS, um, but they didn't have them in a high resolution format. They were just JPEGs on a disk that they gave us. And so what we've done over the past year is work with MHEN to, so they understand that um, 
you know, the value of providing these data in a form that's more palatable for these users. I mean, urban planners want to be able to pick up these projections and incorporate them into their other spatial representations, um, you know, into something like GIS. And so providing the data in that format would have been, would have been helpful. Um, but they are available um, and, and, you know, pretty locally specific. In terms of uncertainties, um, we were, I guess maybe we can say fortunate um, that the Vietnam government had adopted an official scenario that they would prefer uh, their um, organizations to use in their climate change planning, and that was the B2 scenario. So we just communicated the B2 scenario within the tool, but we wanted to acknowledge that other scenarios exist and um, encourage users to understand the differences between those scenarios. And so we provide a climate data tab on the tool that provides some background information on um, what those different scenarios are, what the model assumptions are, and um, and the inherent uncertainties associated with those. And we also provide a range of values um, in the projection summaries to represent you know, uncertainties mm -hmm. in that way as well. Great answer, thanks so much. Uh, next we have uh, Chaz Cadwell, he's from the Urban Institute here in Washington DC. He asks, what regular decisions made by local officials has the tool proved most amenable amendable to support? What regular decisions made by local officials has the tool proved most amenable to support? Um, I think what I've learned through this process is um, the zoning decisions seem to be the most popular adjustments that are made um, in response to the tool. And I think it's, it's an adjustment that um, the reviewers or managers who are uh, in charge of approving these plans are most kind of understanding of and palatable to. So if they see a map and see that an area is going to be flooded, they understand, okay, we need to change what's being developed in that location. So I'd say that would be the primary adjustment. And yeah, Chu's going to add something. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I would like to add one thing to that um, answer is that the um, the tool has proved that it's most suitable for master plans um, in Vietnam. So most of the plans that have been either modified or revisited using the tool have been master plans. And um, that's also the answer that we got from um, the actual tool user that have used the tool um, so far. Great. Um... Pam Rubinoff, uh, professor at University of Rhode Island. She's in the Coastal Resources Center. Hi, Pam. Um, and a follow-up to the follow-up question to the challenge in translating the tool from Seattle to Vietnam. Uh, what is, in a broader sense, the level of effort needed to translate uh, the tool to other U.S. or international areas? So expanding beyond Vietnam, what would the level of, level of effort be required to translate it now? more efficient maybe or yeah I mean I think we definitely have streamlined the process and we understand the you know the minimum of what's needed to have this be a successful tool and useful um, that being said it does require some hand-holding in a way um, you know it really just depends on the existing organizational structure and data availability um, so, for example, in Huey, we were fortunate in that there was already an existing stakeholder group that we could leverage that had been talking about climate change for a while. They are aware of the issues, and so it was relatively easy to kind of pick up where they left off and continue the conversation. Um, but, you know, if a stakeholder group like that doesn't exist, then and building that from scratch would require, you know, more effort on that in that space. So. Mm -hmm. I think it just depends on the location and kind of where they're at. Um, but, you know, in summary, it really is just about meeting with the users, talking with them, making sure they understand the issues, being able to gather the relevant climate information, um, and then, you know, tweak the tool a little to accommodate those differences. Great. Um... So we're at the at the two o'clock uh, mark. Um, this um, officially marks the end of uh, today's webinar, but we will continue with the Q and A if uh, participants would like to 
uh, stay on the line. Um, we'll stay on for another 10 minutes if uh, Andrea and Tu can stay on with us. Yep. Um, but I would like to thank everyone who joined us today. Um, and if you have any questions about uh, resources um, or access to this webinar after it's um, after we finished, just send me an email. Um, it's Michael Cody. It's michael.cody at agilitycorp.com. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Um, Okay, so let's uh, let me just continue here, if you don't mind. Hey, I'm gonna hey get to, Michael, uh, Dejan. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Sure, please. A couple people have asked if there's an English version of the tool or an English version of the downloadable report that's available over here on the left-hand side. I is that? Can you possibly answer that? I could answer that. Um, I think that would be Andrew. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the the tool has now evolved. Um, from, we originally had an English and Vietnam parallel version, um, but then since July 2014, when we held our national workshop and officially transferred ownership, now it is only being maintained in Vietnamese. Um, so we do not have an updated English tool available. However, um, the user guide should provide some insight, um, and it has some screenshots, so hopefully it can give you a better idea of what's included. Um, and you can kind of get a feel for it with the Vietnamese tool, but um, you know that obviously won't get you all the way <laughs> if you're not a Vietnamese language expert. Yeah. Um, okay, so next question here we have is from Dejan Bratuljevic. Um, sorry, Dejan, I don't have your affiliation immediately available to me, but um, I'll continue here with your question, which is, how will this tool impact design and construction of appropriate structures to be built? that will support resilience of local people related to impacts of climate change. Um, I'm an independent, oh, excuse me, thanks, Dejan. I'm an independent infrastructure and environmental consultant, and I've worked in the Pacific Islands on the CCAP project. Thanks, Dejan. Um, yeah, so it, it includes recommendations for design um, and construction. So, for example, um, the types of materials to be used um, or design elements specific to buildings like green roofs um, or natural cooling ventilation systems. So it, it definitely includes recommendations around design and construction specifically. Um, but in terms, maybe your question is asking how, to what extent planning is translated to actual design and construction on the ground. Um, and, you know, that is a, a bit of an open question, uh, you know, I think this applies anywhere throughout the world that what you plan isn't always what's built. And that's certainly true in Vietnam. Um, but these plans are uh, revised every five years. And um, so they tend to stay up to date with what, what is currently built. And um, I think do inform mm -hmm. development um, to a significant extent, um, but you know, not entirely. So that should be noted. Okay, thanks. Um, we have a question here from Andrew Simons, or Simmons. Um, he says, great work. Um, he previously worked as a heritage planner with PPJ Consortium on the challenging Greater Hanoi Construction Plan to 2030. One of the challenges he faced was uh, introducing strategic planning following an integrated approach um, that is actionable, countering what in Vietnam is normally a highly pres prescriptive constructed outcome focus. So I, I think he's saying it's a top-down kind of mm -hmm. focus. In Vietnam, it was quite difficult to cut across sectors and you know sectors and ministries. Um, can you talk a bit about how the tool is able to facilitate interaction between uh, different ministries in Vietnam? Yeah, um, we try to facilitate interaction between the Departments of Natural Resources and Environment and the Departments of Construction. So for each of our trainings, we invited both of those departments as well as relevant consulting firms, because as, as I understand, quite a few of the urban planning projects in Vietnam are conducted by consulting firms. Um, so we invited all of those parties to our trainings um, and actually it was great because through those trainings it almost became a direct conversation where instead of asking us questions about the tool it was more the departments of construction asking the department of natural resources and environment directly 
questions about available climate information and projects that they're mm -hmm. um, currently working on. So I think by bringing those parties together through this training, not only are they benefiting from the training itself, but they're also exchanging business cards and forming relationships that will hopefully um, be lasting, you know, beyond the scope of this project. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Um, I think that concludes if anyone else has any questions um, you should put them in right away but I think this is uh, quite enlightening and um, well, it looks like we have one more person typing <laughs> multiple questions coming in right now um, so maybe I'll just I'll just ask you Andrew while people are typing um, you know do you, do you think that Simpact DSD this tool do you think it would only work in urban settings or could it be applied in other settings So you can answer that. Yeah, Michael, I can take that question. So um, I we believe that the tool could be used in both urban and rural settings. So um, in fact, we have used this tool to look at issues in zoning and planning for agriculture. So for example, if um, a region is flooded easily or um, kind of prone to salinity intrusion, um, we can think about having um, salt water tolerant crops for that region. Um, so that's one of the things that we can do. And as long as we have available information for um, rural area or um, agriculture, we can Im include them as um, sectors in the tool. So yes, the tool could be used for not just urban setting, but other setting as well. Great, thanks. Um... We have a question from Rigzom Wangchuk. Sorry, I didn't get your affiliation, and I, I'm sorry if I um, if I didn't pronounce your name correctly, Rigzom. Um, but your question is: Was was this tool? I'll, I'll ask this to Andrea. Was this tool used in the ACERN initiative in Vietnam? That's the ACCCRN yeah. initiative. Um, no, I think the ACERN initiative was winding down when our project started. So we took some of the reports that came through that process and integrated them, but um, it was not used directly because it came afterwards. Okay. Rigzom is with uh, Mercy Corps, by the way. Great. Just found out. Um, okay, so that uh, let's just wrap up. Thank you, everyone, um, for participating today. If you have any questions, again, just send me an email. Uh, my name is Michael Cody, and my email address is michael.cody at angelitycorp.com. And, of course, um, we have a website. Um, I'll put that up on the screen now. <laughs> we have a website, ccrdproject.com. You can find all our email addresses uh, there, as well as 